Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are joining us from today. As Gioni mentioned, my name is Noah Henderson, and I am an annual natural gas manager here at the IEA in our energy data center. As Dioni mentioned, uh, there'll be a Q&A section after the presentation. So please put your questions in chat and I can answer them after the presentation or perhaps my colleagues can help out and answer throughout the presentation. Also, as a quick reminder, all of the presentations and exercise uh, sheets will be made available at the end of the statistics course. So yeah, you'll have access to, to everything you're seeing today. Moving on to the presentation. So the presentation is divided into three different sections like Dioni mentioned, starting with natural gas trends, moving on to some key concepts, and then finishing looking at the data reporting and the natural gas questionnaire that we collect here at the IEA. So first with the trends, over the last 40 years, natural gas production has almost tripled and it has expanded greatly over that period. Natural gas was the second largest gross contributor to global energy growth, only behind coal. Post-World War II, the production of natural gas expanded earliest and most quickly in North America and the former Soviet Union. And this trend has continued today with the USA and Russia being the two largest producers in the world. And they combined to make up just over 40% of global production. For natural gas demand, um, it has also increased to match production, of course, and now it, can, it is just under 25% of total energy supply, TES, and it is also consumed in many different sectors that we'll be looking at later. It is a very flexible fuel and can be used in many different situations. For trade, Given the continually changing regional and global supply and de demand dynamics, an increased focus has been placed on moving gas internationally to match production with consumption. However, to move natural gas, this requires an investment in infrastructure, whether that be pipelines to move gas across land or liquefied natural gas infrastructure, LNG, to move it across larger bodies of water. LNG has slowly been increasing its share of total gas trade, and it is now over 40% of total trade. A couple of the main importers of gas are Japan for LNG and Germany for gaseous gas through pipelines. It is also important to note that both liquefied natural gas and natural gas and its gaseous state are the exact same commodity. And it should not be confused with the various oil or coal products that um, are differentiated. However, LNG trade is reported separately due to the specialized infrastructure that is required to trade it over long distances. Finally, on to emissions. Natural gas benefits from being the fossil fuel that has the lowest emissions per energy unit burned. Uh, it emits around 40 to 50% less CO2 than coal and around 30% less than oil per energy unit burned. Because of this, many people consider natural gas a key transition fuel as we move to cleaner energy systems. Here are some interesting graphs that show the different production and consumption of natural gas. As was mentioned on the last side, gas comprises roughly a quarter of total energy supply globally, but this can change greatly on a country by country basis. On the graph on the right, you can see here that large emerging economies such as China and India have a relatively small amount of gas in their energy supply, around six or 7%. Whereas the large producing countries, United States and Russia have much more natural gas in their energy supply. United States with 32% natural gas and Russia with 54% natural gas. 
on the right, you can see uh, the couple graphs that just show the general consumption and production of natural gas and how it is used in many different sectors and also produced in many different regions globally. On to section two for the presentation with key concepts. Um, in some ways, natural gas is similar to oil, which you may be more familiar with, since it comes from the same organic source material and it forms in comparable geological conditions, but it does form in higher and pressure and temperature ranges typically. Natural gas can be defined as a combustible mixture of hydrocarbon gases that contains a very high concentration of methane, usually over 90%. The other combustible fuels, such as coal and oil, are classified according to their compositions and gross calorific values, but natural gas is treated just as one single product. And the various natural gas mixtures can have gross calorific values that mostly span between 37 and 42 megajoules per cubic meter. But of course, there are outliers that can have higher or lower calorific values than this range. It is also possible for gases from other fuels to be mixed into the natural gas grid, such as blast furnace gas coming from coal production or biogases coming from renewables production. Also, since quantities of natural gas can be measured in volumes in million cubic meters, we need to define the pressure and temperature conditions to measure it. For international data collection at the IEA, we use the standard conditions which corresponds to 15 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Continuing on to have a brief overview of the natural gas balance, starting with the supply side here, we have the production, the imports from other sources, from other types of gases, trade with imports and exports, and of course, stock changes. And from supply side, we derive the inland consumption calculated. And then we have the statistical difference, which is the difference between the supply side and the data from the demand side, the inland consumption observed, where we have the consumption in all the different end use sectors, transformation, energy sector, transport industry. Efforts should be made to minimize statistical difference to ensure that the data from the supply side of the energy balance matches the data from the demand side. Next, we'll be taking a closer look at a few of these elements of the energy balance, starting with production. So natural gas can be extracted from a, a few different places, from oil fields, from gas fields, or from coal mines. The raw gas that comes directly out of the well includes a number of hydrocarbons and other contaminants along with the methane. These contaminants need to be removed through a series of chemical and thermal processes to make the natural gas suitable for distribution and consumption. Some of the gas is flared or vented when it can't be processed or transported to a treatment plant. And also some of the gas can be re-injected back into the field to enhance the production of the field to ensure the correct pressure is um, within the field. At this step, directly after extraction, the concentration of methane is not very high. It can be as low as 70%. And then after the purification process, the concentration of methane can go as high as 99%. The purification or treatment process consists of separating the methane from the other hydrocarbons, such as natural gas liquids, NGLs, uh, crude oil, removal of impurities such as condensates, water vapor, CO2, and sulfur. The resulting gas after the purification process is called dry marketable production gas. And this is the definition we use at the IEA for all of the gas we track in our energy balances. Dry marketable production can be further separated into associated gas, 
for gas coming from oil fields, non-associated gas for gas coming from gas fields, and colliery gas for gas coming from coal mines. Continuing on, we have the supply chain here and uh, our methodology at the IA of collecting and uh, reporting data covers all of the different stages of the natural gas supply chain, starting with the production on the slide here that we just looked at, also the receipts coming from other sources from other fuels, such as the biogases coming from renewables. Then we have the data on the infrastructure, which connects the production with consumption. This includes the transmission and distribution systems, the storage facilities, and also the LNG infrastructure. And then finally, we have the natural gas consumed in the many different sectors, whether that be for electricity and heat generation or in the residential and commercial sectors. Of course, a critical aspect of the supply chain to make it all work is the trade to move the natural gas from the production regions and countries to all of the consumers around the globe. And then with the supply chain, we have the arrows which represent all of the different interactions between the elements here. And we'll be looking at a closer, we'll be taking a closer look at all of these elements now. So starting with trade, Trade with natural gas can be done through two main methods, either with gaseous gas through pipelines or with liquefied natural gas LNG with special LNG carriers over bodies of water. Starting with pipelines, they are a very cost-effective way to move natural gas across land or for underwater for short, shallow distances. There are many interstate and local regional pipelines to move gas across shorter distances within countries or regions. But the major pipelines that cross international borders tend to be much larger and much less common. Of course, we can't talk about natural gas trade without referencing the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which uh, vastly changed and disrupted the global network of natural gas trade. Particularly, it highlighted the energy security perspective of the, the, the risks of relying too heavily on a single trade partner for natural gas. And this has really contributed to the, the continued growth and the continued trend of LNG trade. So for LNG, while well, pipelines are useful well, where land routes are available, natural gas that move, needs to move across oceans creates a much more difficult technical and economical challenge. The issue is that the energy per unit of volume is too low. And the solution is to cool natural gas down to the temperature at which it becomes a liquid, which is negative 162 degrees Celsius. This liquefied natural gas increases the amount of energy that can be stored in a given volume by 600 times. As a result, LNG can be more cost effectively transported over the long ocean routes. However, this process to safely cool, load, ship, offload, and reheat the gas uh, requires a lot of capital. And the main components of this, which cost a lot of capital, are liquefaction plants to cool the gas down and turn it into a liquid, LNG carriers, the specialized ships to transport the gas, and then regasification terminals to turn the LNG back into its gaseous state uh, to be consumed at its destination. Here is an interesting graph that demonstrates the, the key trend of growing LNG trade. And this is a trend that is only expected to continue into the future as, as gas is traded more globally and a, on a more flexible basis. Stocks are also very useful and critical aspect when it comes to natural gas. Natural gas is just a source of potential energy that can be stored to be used in a different time or a different place. Storage is often used to shift a constant level of available production to match seasonal demand fluctuations, particularly, for example, here on the slide in the Northern Hemisphere for OECD Europe, 
there was a very distinct demand peak in the winter months when natural gas is used more heavily for heating and a demand trough in the summer months when demand is not as high. Storing significant amounts of gas tends to rely on underground storage as the most economical solution. The bulk of storage happens in depleted gas reservoirs. Other geological formations, such as aquifers or salt caverns, can also be used for storage. Overall, stocks provide the required uh, seasonal flexibility coming from a relatively flat supply. There is a combination of price signals from the markets and regulations that drive the operation of the storage facilities, which often build stocks during the summer months of low demand uh, to supply the grid in the winter months of higher demand as seen on the slide here. Now on to demand. You can see on the slide all of the different sectors where natural gas is consumed. It's a very flexible fuel. Uh, in particular, we're going to look at a few of the sectors here that might not be completely intuitive or completely clear uh, just by the name. So let's look at them now. So starting with the transformation sector, this includes all demand to convert gas into another energy form. This could be electricity gas or electricity or blast furnace gas, for example. The energy sector includes the consumption of gas to support the operations of energy sector. For example, natural gas that is burned for oil and gas extraction or in an oil refinery. The key difference is that the gas is burned, but it is not transformed into a different commodity. So that is the difference between transformation and energy. Transformation, the gas is transformed, and energy, it is just burned for its energy content. And then the last sector we'll take a closer look is, or not a sector, but when it comes to the non-energy use of natural gas, this refers to gas that is used not for its energy content, but is used as a feedstock to produce a non-energy hydrocarbon raw material. For instance, instance, this could be fertilizers or plastics. So natural gas isn't used for, it isn't being burned for its energy, but it's being used as a feedstock to produce the, the material such as fertilizers or plastics. Here's the transformation sector and many of the transformations that natural gas can undergo at electricity or heat plants, of course, into electricity or heat, or at various coal plants and coke ovens, blast furnaces to create coal's gaseous byproducts, or at a gas to liquids plant to produce oil products. So it is quite flexible and can be transformed into a number of other energy commodities. On to the final stage of the presentation here with data reporting and our annual questionnaire. So with our data collection at the IEA, we ask national administrations to fill a questionnaire on a yearly basis. And this gives us all the data of all the different steps of the supply chain and all the different consumption sectors that we've just had a look at. And its structure, you can see on the slide here with six different tables covering supply, consumption, trade, and infrastructure. After data collection, we, uh, the, we go through a validation and processing steps to ensure the quality and the comparability of the data across time and between countries. This involves making sure that the proper methodological standards were used when filling in the questionnaire, and also that there is consistency between the different tables within the questionnaire and also with the other fuel questionnaires. As a quick example, ensuring that the consumption reported in table one supply matches the demand reported in table two, and also that the receipts from other sources in table one matches the data in the other questionnaire, such as biogases coming from the renewables questionnaire that the data needs to match. Here is what the questionnaire looks like, looks like looking at table one. As a reminder, we only count dry marketable production of gas, which excludes 
any gas vented or flared, any losses or reinjected quantities. Uh, we collect data in million cubic meters, in terajoules, and average gross calorific values. Average net calorific values then can be estimated as 90% of the gross calorific values. Uh, another important note here for trade is that we only count gas that crosses the physical boundary of the country. And also we exclude any transit or re-exports. Continuing on looking at table two for consumption where we ask for data in terajoules and we can then convert to million cubic meters with the gross calorific values reported in table one. In table 2A here, we have the transformation sector, the energy sector, and also transmission and distribution losses. Here we have table 2B with final consumption, transport, industrial sectors, and other sectors. In final consumption, we also differentiate between energy use and non-energy use, which once again, energy use, natural gas is used as a fuel, and non-energy use, natural gas is used as a raw material. One specific bit of reporting that can be a little bit confusing when it comes to these tables is with transformation. So for gas, there are three different plant types. There's electricity plants, heat plants, and combined heat and power plants, CHP plants. And then these are further uh, broken down with two different types of activities. Main activity producers, which are entities or companies whose sole or main purpose is to produce and sell electricity or heat, and auto producers, which are entities that produce electricity or heat as a byproduct of another primary activity. There are specific reporting for auto producers that can be confusing, so let's review. Within transformation reporting in Table 2A, we want to avoid counting any the heat which is consumed by the auto producer for its primary activity, as this is consumption and it should be, be reported in table 2B. In table in transformation sector, we should only be reporting the consumption for heat that is then sold onwards by the auto producer. For electricity, all production and of electricity and the consumption by gas is reported in transformation in table 2A. So this can be a little tricky, but you can review the slide after and uh, send us any questions. Then the last key tables here are tables three and four with trade imports by origin and exports by destination, where we have at data in total imports and data by LNG trade, and we can easily calculate the pipeline trade there. And then Important to note here, we ask for the ultimate country of origin and the ultimate country of destination. So where the gas was ultimately produced and where the gas is ultimately consumed. This is definitely an area which um, can be difficult for some countries to report in that manner. There are definitely some limitations to the gas reporting. Firstly, we treat gas as a single product when in fact there are often gases with high and low calorific values used in the same gas system. So therefore we ask gas, we ask countries to report the average calorific values of their gases. Secondly, for natural gas, there are a lot of uh, technologies and innovations when it comes to trade and LNG trade, which means that there is an increasing global factor when it comes to trade and transit trade. And this makes it much di more difficult for countries to identify the ultimate origin or destination, destination as I mentioned previously. The final problem we can encounter are measuring gas and volumes. As was mentioned at the start of the presentation, we measure using the standard conditions at 15 degrees Celsius, but gas can also be measured using normal conditions of uh, zero degrees Celsius. And therefore that we just need to be careful when uh, comparing gas to transfer between the right uh, values to ensure that we're all measuring at the same temperatures and pressures. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and listening. Here are some key resources that you may like to use. 
And next, we'll continue on to looking at any uh, questions that you have for us.